we have um, Vacation Bible School coming up the first week of June. Uh, it's June 6 through 10. We're still looking for help. We have a meeting today at 3 o'clock just for the leaders. You don't have to be there for that if you're going to help. But um, we're just kind of looking for people to help lead groups, kind of the normal stuff. It's at Trinity this year. Jill Koonsman is um, the one that's the director of Bible School this year. So um, questions can be directed to her. And, of course, I can always try to answer questions, too, if you have them. But uh, we're just looking for some help. We need help with um, some lessons, I know, and uh, kitchen stuff. And I know we'll need donations, too. I don't know what that will be discussed today at the meeting, too, as well. So we'll have more information about what we need for food donations, hopefully, next week. But um, just wanted to share with you that we're looking for help. And, you know, we always ask for prayers because that's important. And we know that God's going to give us the guidance to get through this. So we'll just plugging away but um we're always looking for help and i know so it's going to be um, from 6 to 8 30 at night so if you work during the day it doesn't affect your working schedule which is nice and uh it's going to be sunday to thursday so we'll finish on thursday night we'll begin on sunday also i wanted to thank the people that were there to help with subs yesterday we had a good turnout and um made a lot of subs had a good morning, and if you have subs that you wanted left here, they're in one of the fridges. Um, if you owe money, you can certainly give that to me. Um, if you have questions about it, let me know. We did have a little bit of meat left over and some cheese, so if there's, if you're interested in that at all, you can just give a donation to the church office and grab it out of the fridge in the, in the kitchen. Thank you. How many subs? I don't have an exact number, I'm sorry, but I, yeah, like we're, <laughs> I didn't have a total, I'm sorry. We probably did, for Subwise, we had about 45 dozen white and wheat together, and we had about 25 dozen of the croissants. So we had a good sale. Thank you very much. Good morning, Grace. Good morning. Good morning, Grace. Good to see you here this morning. I want to welcome our visitors, uh, those of you who are here the first time, those of you who are watching for the first time online. Welcome. Welcome to a great time of worship in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. A couple of announcements this morning. There is a supervised nursery today. Uh, we've been advertising this for individuals to take a Sunday so we can have a supervised nursery so the people with families can uh, enjoy worship as well. Uh, there is a supervised nursery today. Sign up sheet is in the hallway. Uh, if this is a calling, if you want to take a Sunday, we would really appreciate that. It's a, it's a real benefit to have for our church. Uh, one other announcement that uh, we're having communion today, and it was brought to my attention last month, and I forgot it. <clears throat> Family had asked me about their children. Uh, I guess how I address whether or not your children can take communion is really pretty simple. If you, as a parent, have sat your child down and they can make a confession of faith and they understand who Jesus Christ is, we leave that up to you as a family and I encourage you to have that discussion. And if you're okay that they're confessing to believe in Jesus, then they can commune. Um, that's kind of where we stand with that right now. Uh, if they confess to believe, they are welcomed at the table. Today is communion then, obviously. If you didn't get the little cup in the way for coming in, raise your hand and one of the ushers will uh, get you a cup. One down here in the front. This hopefully is our last Sunday with these very unique uh, process. Uh, that's all I'll say about them. Next month we will move back to the, probably the form of intinction. I know that's been our communion choice here. Okay. Thanks, Steve. One other uh, area of, of praise and worship that I would like to just briefly speak of, and I did last week, uh, there's a learning curve here for praise and worship, and uh, many times people don't really understand praise and worship. There, there are two different categories. So we come into the fellowship, we come into the time here of worship. Uh, worship is, is a totally different word than praise. So worship, you, you feel the presence of God and you, you worship, you might be animated, some of you jump and shout, uh, some of you sit on your hands, uh, it doesn't make any difference. That's your worship, okay? So you're, you're moved by the music, you're worshiping God. But then a song may come 
And it moves you into a time of praise. Uh, praise is where, or do I have them backwards? I got them backwards, I'm sorry. Praise is when you're animated and you moved and you're singing. Praise is the God. Worship is you're touched by the song, the Holy Spirit moves in you, and you cry. You shake. You get goosebumps. Isn't that a weird phrase? Goosebumps. <coughs> the hair stands up on the back of your head. There, there's a difference. So there's a time of praise and there's a time of worship. And generally, in a fellowship like this, you will experience both, and you should. So don't, don't be afraid. We're pretty open in our praise, and we're open in how you want to worship. If you feel moved to sit down during that song, and you want to pray, that's okay. That's what it's about. And my prayer every week uh, before we come together as a fellowship is that the Holy Spirit is present, he moves, he touches, and that's your time with him. So, if you have any questions about that, but I'll do more explanation on this as we go forward. I actually have a three-part sermon series on praise and worship so we get the difference and we understand it. Any prayer concerns this morning? Okay. Let's open with a word of prayer before we worship. Father, we come before you today and we do thank you. We thank you for the gift of life through your son Jesus. Our eyes are opened, our spirit is revealed, and we get to worship and praise you. Father, we do ask for that presence of the spirit today, that we can bask in your presence, and we leave here knowing full well that you are alive. And we worship you in spirit and truth. We thank you for the, the people. We thank you for all the burdens that are brought. And Jesus flat out said, you don't come together for those who are healthy. I came for those who need help. And that's all of us. We thank you, Jesus. We pray for those who are watching online today that no matter where you are, no matter where you're at, at this time, that the Holy Spirit invades your space and your presence and your heart is open to hear and receive as all of us. Thank you for an opportunity to commune with you and to be one with you again and to be reminded of how great you are and the salvation that we have. Bless our morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Take that top cellophane off so you have the body of Christ in your hand. Jesus instituted uh, the meal so that we could be reminded of the power of what was about to happen that evening. He sat the guys down, and the night before he was betrayed, he, he distributed the body and the blood, as he called it, the bread and the wine, and he told them certain things to remember the events that were going to unfold. Communion is not a means of salvation. You do not take communion and receive salvation, but it's a reminder of how salvation happened and what he has done. It's a reminder. And Paul says to examine yourself. Uh, sometimes we have a tendency to come to the table and it's a time of examination to think, well, I, I need to ask for forgiveness of this sin or that sin or this happened this week. Those are all good things to do to bring those before the Lord and ask for forgiveness. But the reminder before you come to the table is not about the sins that you have committed. It's the reminder, have you confessed to believe in Jesus? That's what he's asking you to examine yourself about. Do, do you have a confession of faith that Jesus Christ is the Son of God? that he sent him to earth to take away the sin of the world. John looked at him and said, Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sin. And if you confess to believe in that and you've received that, you now have been set free from the bondage of sin. That's the examination. I give you a time this morning just to have that time before God. And go through that process. When's the last time you just sat down and said, Jesus, I thank you for my salvation.
Father, we come before you today with the body in our hand as a reminder of what you accomplished. We thank you that the blood on the doorpost at the first Passover, you didn't look at the people on the inside, you looked at the blood on the doorpost. And the same is for us today. When you look at us, you see the blood of Jesus that has redeemed us. You sat the disciples down and you said on the night that you were to be betrayed, you took the bread, you broke it, and you gave it to the, to the disciples and you said, this is my body, I'm giving it freely to you. Take and eat of it in remembrance of me, the body of Christ given for you. You took the cup, you drank of it, and you handed it to them, and you said, drink of it, all of you. This cup is the new covenant in my blood. We thank you, Jesus, for the new covenant, the blood that has redeemed us, the blood that restored us back in the relationship with the Father. Drink of it, all of you, in remembrance of me, the blood of Jesus shed for you. Father, we thank you for such an intimate closeness that you purposely designed that we can have one more way to be reminded of how close you are to us. That we ingest you and you remind us that I'm in you, I'm with you, I'm here for you, I walk with you, and I'm your God. Thank you, Jesus for the greatest gift ever known to mankind. We praise you for it. Thank you. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Children's Church. Children may be dismissed. Communion's always a good time, isn't it? Yeah, yeah thank you. All right. Um, we're on a journey to Pentecost. And very clearly, without the cross, there's no salvation. Without the empty tomb, there's no salvation. Jesus walks on the earth for 40 days. Without the ascension, it wouldn't have been complete. And then we have the inaugural service of the Holy Spirit. Without the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, this thing wouldn't have been complete. So we're moving on the journey, the spiritual journey, to this ascension date. We're only a few weeks away. So today, the fleshly desires versus spiritual insights. As we move closer and closer to understanding the power and the presence and the purpose of the Holy Spirit, I want to talk today about your fleshly desires. Uh, you don't have to get very deep into the fleshly desires for people to relate to you. There's things that we say that we wish we would have never said. There's things that we do that we wish we would have never done. Anybody relate to what I just said? Yes. yes. And it comes out of our mouth, and then it's like... Yes. And the words are out, you can't get them back. Words are eternal. Sometimes we hurt people with words very deeply. And Paul makes it very clear. He says, why do I do what I don't want to do and why don't I do what I do want to do? I don't know what I just said. <laughs> I think I got it right. 
Why, why is that? Why, why does the flesh get to do what it wants to do, but you know you shouldn't do it, but you still do it? There's nobody that takes a hit of cocaine for the first time knowing full well that I should not be doing this. Premarital sex, the first time you do it, you, you know you shouldn't do it, but you do it. So today, why are the fleshly desires so overpowering to the spiritual insights? Because we know, but we still do. I'm going to give you one surefire way today so you can walk in the, walk in the acts in the fruit of the spirit instead of the acts of the flesh. I want you to pay attention to how I worded that. It's not fruit of the flesh. It's acts of the flesh, fruit of the spirit. So we can leave here knowing full well that no, I don't have to do that. I can... Walk in the fruit of the Spirit. We're going to go to Galatians chapter 5, 17 through 21, and it's an intense list, uh, but Paul makes it very clear to the church in Galatia. The desires of the flesh are against the Spirit. The desires of the Spirit are against the flesh. You are at war. You're a trichotomy. This is your soul. This is your thinker. This is your intellect housed in a fleshly body, which Paul calls your tent, and indwelled by the presence of the Holy Spirit by God himself. So you have the spirit, you have the flesh, and you have your intellect. Now, this is the decider. This is what makes the decision, your soul, your intellect. So it gets fed information from the flesh. Yes, have the premarital affair. The flesh is going to love it. Go for it. Come on. That's what the flesh says. But then the spirit says, no. Learning to listen to the right one. They're both there. They're waging war against each other. Paul makes it very clear. The desires of the spirit are against the flesh. They're opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things you want to do. And there comes his Roman language. Why do I do what I don't want to do? But if you're led by the spirit, you're not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are evident. And hang on. Sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, sorcery. Uh, this is dynamic worship. Uh, this is male witches, which is called a man witch. I like that. Male witches, witches, idolatry, worshiping the enemy is sorcery. And folks, it's real. It's here in Hartley. Uh, people live in a sheltered life, but this is real. Enmity, strife, jealousy. Nobody's ever been jealous. Fits of rage. Nobody's ever had a fit of anger. A rivalry, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies. Man, many theologians, including myself, would call this the dirty dozen. This is an intense list. And things like these. I warn you, as I've warned you before, that those who do such things are, will not inherit the kingdom of God. Now, let me just qualify that statement. If you're not saved and you're living in this list, you will not inherit the kingdom of God. If you have done these and you are saved, there's repentance and the blood of Jesus redeems you. But, I love but in the Greek language. It's an Allah. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Anybody need self-control? Over the mouth, over the actions, self-control. Against such things there is no law. And those who belong to Jesus Christ have crucified this flesh with its passions and its desires. Verse 25, if we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. If we live by the Spirit. Let us also keep in step with the Spirit. Just a little explanation. Debauchery. Uh, I'm, I always read from the ESV. is not used exclusively there, but debauchery is excessive indulgence into pleasure. America suffers from debauchery. Excessive divulgence into pleasure. Dissensions. Keep arguing in the meeting. I'm going to make my point. They're going to get learned by me. Anybody been a dissensioner? Yeah. Factions. Factions is another word here. Uh, you organize a coup. And in this comes gossip. Uh, a faction is very dangerous in the body of Christ. 
So you, you got a problem and you go over here and you talk to the women's Bible study and you organize a coup that you want to convince everybody to think like you do so then you can get a coup going and you get a group going. Instead of going to the elder or the pastor or whoever you need to go to, you get this group going and that works backwards from this list because if you get a coup going pretty soon there's dissensions you're arguing your point and it's all about you i've sat in way too many meetings over 25 years in full-time ministry where there was a coup in the room against me they were there to hurt me they were there to crucify me they were there because they had a problem and it could have been resolved had they came to me in the first place but instead, factions. Be very careful of this list. This is an intense list. He says, these are desires of the flesh. But then he neutralizes it with the fruit of the Spirit. It cancels out the list if you walk in the fruit of the Spirit. Isn't that cool? So why do we live in the list instead of the fruit of the Spirit? This war is going on. And the Spirit has already won. It's done. It's already been accomplished for us. And listen, the world will always, always build up the flesh. The world is not there for you spiritually. The world will cause you. When I say world, it's the dark demonic father of the world that will build up, start the coup, start the gossip. He encourages the flesh. And ironically, what's really crazy, even though you're saved, your flesh desires that. It's how we're made and we're broken. The world will always encourage the fleshly desires, yet Paul says, walk in the Spirit. Learn how to overcome. The church in Galatia was in trouble. They were struggling with this stuff. They were all saved, and now they're over here doing this crazy work. And he says, no, stop it. Walk in the fruit of the Spirit. 2 Corinthians 7, 1, I'll give you your first takeaway today is how do I walk in the fruit of the Spirit, is claim the promises of God. Claim the promises of God in your prayer time. Father, you promise me that your Spirit lives in me. Since we have these promises, what, what promises? God says, I think so much of you, I put my Spirit in you. you got to tell yourself that. When the temptation comes, Claim the promise God's Spirit is in you. Stop it. I'm going to start a coup. Stop it. I'm going to lie about my neighbor. Stop it. He says, claim the promises, beloved. Claim them. And go back to where I started. You know full well when you start the action that it's wrong. And just stop. Stop right there. Let us cleanse. Cleanse ourselves. Cleanse. How many of you took a bath this, to this morning? Don't raise your hand. I, I ask some crazy <laughs> questions sometimes. So you, you didn't take a bath on January 1st. Hallelujah, it's 2021. I got the bath done. And you don't bathe for the rest of the year. Anybody? Yeah, no. So <laughs> cleanse, cleanse, cleanse. So we bathe daily. So what he's saying is take in the daily digestion of the word of God. Cleanse yourself of the washing of the word. Bring it in. Let it do its job. Cleanse yourself from every defilement of the body and spirit, bringing holiness to completion in the fear of God. Don't claim the promises of the IRS. They're not going to keep sending you checks in the mailbox. Don't claim the promises of the world. Claim the promises that are from God alone. And what we do here in, in this bathing and in this washing process, we have a tendency to elevate flesh. We have a tendency to think, you know what, I'm pretty good. I don't need to go to church. I don't need to do the Bible study. I got it made. I got this thing licked. Any person that's had an addiction, ask them how that worked for them. They'll end up falling back. If you think you've made it, and now you've taken the position of Christ, and you're on the throne and he's not, you're in trouble. And we actually have a tendency to want to put, there's two sides to this. We want to put Jesus back on the cross. Some people believe that you've got to grovel back to God every time you fall. And we want to put him back on the cross and I've got to get saved again, which is unbiblical. But the other position of this is that you need to see yourself on the cross. He died, Paul says, the flesh is crucified. See it as done work. That list has been accomplished and taken care of. 
See the empty tomb. See the ascension. Let in the theater. God gave us these minds that are so cool. I read and I speak in pictures. I see what I say. So, so when you're in that prayer time, empty tomb, Jesus walked on the earth. He's with people. They, they touched him. He ate with them. He ascends into heaven. Wouldn't that be cool? I don't know about you, but I don't know how everybody on the planet earth just missed so much of what happened there. I mean, I would just think everybody was saved right there. Whoop. See it in your mind. That's what he's saying. Cleanse yourself from this. Walk it out. Live it out. Don't fall into the sins of the flesh. And the more you do this, the more you become hungry, and the more you want more, and pretty soon you're running, and the flesh is canceled, and the word becomes alive. Cleanse yourself by the washing of the word. Romans 8, 11, 17. If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the de dead dwells in you. Notice he qualifies it with an if. Only a saved person has the spirit of God in them. So if you're a saved person, you've got the spirit of God in you. He who raised Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. I use this at every funeral that I do. What God did to Jesus, you confess to believe he's going to do to you and there's no more death. Is the tomb empty? Yes. Do you confess to believe? You will never die. Physically, yes. Spiritually, no. So then, brothers, we are debtors not to the flesh. Paul just hammers away at this. Not to the flesh. To live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you're dead. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body and you live... For all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. And if you did not, for you did not receive a spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption by sons whom we cry, Dad! Abba is Dad. There's a beautiful picture here. Learning how to walk by the Spirit, not by the ways of the flesh. You're over here, separated from God, living in the dark, the Father's over here, and he says, I have chose you, and you, and you, and you. I have chosen. Adoption means you were chosen. Adoption means you were once separated, but the Father says, I chose you. And my son died for all. I chose you. There's so much power in that. And once we get this in our mind that I can live and walk by the Spirit because He chose me and I can cry out, Dad! And He's got your best interest in mind all the time. Can you imagine a dad? Yes, you can. Watching your child digress. Some of you have. Can you imagine as a parent, you watch your child go down the road of drugs, adultery, affairs, and who knows where it ends up. And you have to watch that. And the father, dad, watches. And he just waits for us to turn and come back into the spiritual relationship. The Spirit himself bears witness to with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs of Christ, provided we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. So how do we live in the Spirit? How do we do it? Take a look at this picture. Take a look at this slide. What do you see? What do you see? White piece of paper with a dot. What, what's the first thing that came to your mind? Black circle. Black circle. Okay. Your brain, your fallen flesh, is automatically attuned and accustomed to always see the bad. Your fallen fleshly desires will always see the fault. So many of you looked at that and you said, oh, black circle. Why didn't you see all the white? Our, our fallen nature will always look to the problem. We'll always look to the broken issue. We will always see the faults in other people. 
Isn't that crazy? Your fallen nature saw, well, it's a black dot. What about all the white that's on the page? Look at the next slide. What do you see? White. So when you confess to believe and receive the blood of Jesus Christ and you are redeemed, this is what Jesus sees. What did John say? Look, behold the Lamb of God who takes away 43.5% of all your sin. Look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. When you're a born-again believer, now a brand new person, this is how Jesus sees you. Without spot, stain, blemish, or wrinkle. Was the blood effective? Yes, you just took communion and you said, thank you, Jesus. So why, go back to the dot page, why if you just took communion and you said, thank you, Jesus, for the blood, why do you look at the dot? Because if you're looking at the dot, you're living in the flesh. How do we train ourselves then to see the blank page? There's a pastor in Texas I don't know his name, so I'll give credit to a pastor in Texas, who said that in, in this process, as humankind, we see the dot on the page, but he said churches are the worst ever. Because churches shoot the wounded. That's a zinger. We have a tendency to look at the person who has had the adulterous affair and they finally make their way back into worship and instead of going up to them and embracing them, the fruit of the Spirit is what? Love and embracing them with the love of Jesus. We get a coup, we do a fraction and we get a coup together. And did you hear about him? Did you know who it was with? Oh my. That's what we do. He said, you shoot the wounded. Because we look at the dot, we look at the sin, we look at the brokenness. Instead of looking at who we are. And God says that when you live in the spirit, you have self-control. So many times a church fails at who we are to be. How we are to love, how we are to exercise self-control. No, actually, we're probably better at living in the dirty dozen than we are in the fruits of the Spirit. So how do we do it? How, how, how do we live in the fruit of the Spirit? Here's the tree. God, John, John makes it very clear, John 15, he says, I abide in you and you abide in me, and we become one and we can make this thing happen. Here's the tree. His name is God. We're the branch, right? We're grafted in. We're adopted into the family. We're the branch. Tree, branch. But over here is the fruit. How do we produce the fruit of the Spirit? I've been in way too many interviews, and now they do a survey, and let's, let's see what your gifts of the Spirit are. Nobody asks you about the fruit of the Spirit. And quite frankly, I could care less about your gifts. I want to know more about your fruit. Because if you're not abiding in Him, you're not producing fruit, and your gifts are worthless. So how do we produce the fruit of the Spirit? Tree, branch, fruit. Holy Spirit in me, what, what makes a fruit grow? There's a seed. The Holy Spirit's a seed in you. Here's the craziest thing. You have everything in you right now to produce. All of it's in there. It's all there. What's in a seed? 150 foot giant sequoia. It's in the seed. You have the Holy Spirit in you. You have everything you need to produce the fruit. But the seed has to be what? Germinated. And once the seed is germinated, now it produces fruit. Fruit that will last. How is the seed germinated? Tree, branch, I abide in Christ. I'm going to be germinated. You're germinated through the power and the presence of the Word of God. I don't need to go to church anymore. I'm good to go. I took a bath January 1st. I don't need to go to Bible study. I don't need to read the Word. I don't need to spend time in fellowship. The more you expose to the light, the greater the production. That's what he's saying. And the greater the production, once the fruit starts to germinate, it negates the works of the flesh. 
Pretty soon, fits of anger, dissension, licentiousness, all of those start to go away because the fruit is starting to produce and it replaces. And I'm not talking about pop psychology, but in real time, in psychology, you can't just tell a person to quit thinking bad thoughts. Well, you've grieved for 15 years, get over it. That's not how it works. It has to be replaced. You've been an addict for 10 years and you have the cravings and the desires. Yes, you can stop thinking about it, but in the brain, the way the psyche works, it's got to be replaced. That's why Paul lays these two lists together. So once the fruit of the Spirit starts to replace, now you start to make production of fruit. Fruit that will last. So, how is your relationship with the Holy Spirit? This is what it comes down to. How is your relationship with the Spirit? And I am amazed at Upper Midwest Iowa, all these churches that have been stoic and doing the same old, same old, and they come to church because my great-grandma and grandpa went to this church and my parents went to this church and I was baptized in this church and I go to church because... And they can't answer you. Oh, I, I go to that brick church on 4th and Main. I've asked people, you know, where do you, what, what is being a Christian? I go to the brick church on 4th and Main. That's how they'll answer me. They have no idea about the relationship with the Holy Spirit. And let me tell you, you're not a human being having a spiritual experience. You're a spirit having a very real human experience. What part of you is going to live forever? Your spirit. This is just a fleshly body. It's going to end up dying. It's going to go away. So the more you expose yourself to the Word, to the teaching, to the Spirit, the more you will produce the fruit of the Spirit. And then, anybody like fresh fruit? I mean, that's the best. That's the best to produce love, to produce joy. God doesn't produce this stuff. Tree, branch, fruit. It's a cooperative working out, exposing yourself to the ways of the world. So stop thinking about what's wrong with you. Go back to the picture of just the, the light. This is how Jesus sees us. And you've been relating to yourself your whole life because of that sin that happened when you were 25. That is not God revealing that to you. That's the devil revealing that to you. This is how he sees you. Philippians 4, 8. This is what Paul says. Finally, brothers. I love his word, finally. Good gosh, we've been down this road how many times? Church in Galatia, church in Ephesus, church in Philippi. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think on this. Not the dot. Think on these things. Not the faults. Thinking about what's right with you. I think you've been around me long enough. I'm not a preacher that's going to come to church and beat you up and tell you everything that's wrong with you. You know what's wrong with you. You need to hear how right you are. You need to hear what the blood of Jesus has done for you. Because we have a tendency to focus on the dot. I'm here to challenge you. I'm here to challenge you about your relationship with the Holy Spirit. He reveals the wisdom of God. The Holy Spirit goes to the library of the Father and he says, Father, what do you want me to reveal to him today? Ask him to reveal the wisdom of God to you. Ask him, what do I need to know today, Holy Spirit? What is God revealing? What does God want me to do today? I'm challenging you that the more you're exposed to the light, the more the fruit can grow and the less the dirty dozen shows up. We all have the fruit. We all have the seed. We all have the ability to do it. I don't, I don't see this on Facebook. You don't, you don't see this kind of teaching. Too many times churches just fail at what the foundation of Scripture actually is. How is your relationship with the Holy Spirit? Speak the truth in love. The first gift, love. 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 Paul, John says that if you abide in me and abide, I, I abide in you, that perfect love casts out all fear. 
There's so much beauty in that, that when we walk in that perfect love, we don't shoot our wounded, we embrace them. We love our neighbor as ourself. We're called to love each other beyond our understanding, but so many of us go to God in prayer, and we want to bend God's ear to Him to do what we want to do. We want to manipulate God into our wants and our needs instead of asking God the Father to do Thy will be done. And when thy will be done, we're no longer a manipulator, but we're a servant and we're adopted into the family and we can produce fruit. I think grace is going to produce fruit like we've never seen before. We're just starting to see it. We're just starting to see the the work of the Holy Spirit. Quite frankly, I don't want it if God's not in it. Amen. Amen? Amen? But we want... No, you don't. Yeah, no. Yeah, but pastor, I need to come in your office and talk. Well, come on in. We don't want it unless God's in it. I love the story, and we're going to get to it in two weeks, in Acts, where they're they're, they're trying to stop the new church. And Ananias stands up at at the meeting, and, and he's the high priest, and he says, listen, guys, if God is in this thing, we cannot stop it. And if he's not in it, it will stop on its own. So let's just leave it alone. If God's in it, it's not going to stop. If it is what God wants, we're going to produce fruit. I want what God wants for us. It all starts with your relationship with the Holy Spirit. And if some of you are sitting here today and you're, yeah, pastor, I agree with everything you say, but you know what? You don't know my life. You don't know my past. You don't know where I've been. You don't know what I've done. You don't know what I've said. Hallelujah, amen. And I'll end with this story. Because of that, the, the foot of the mountain, Moses goes up the hill, and he's receiving from God, and down on the ground, Moses blew us off. He ain't coming back. Let's go back to our Egyptian ways, and let's build a calf. They take their earrings and necklaces. And you ever think about how much gold these people have they made a golden calf simply out of their earrings and necklaces they plundered egypt when they left who was in charge aaron aaron we want you to help us with this process aaron put together the whole process helps him build the golden calf while god's up here giving him the ten commandments and in god's economy he's planning the robe that aaron will wear as a high priest Think on that. While he was whoring around, creating an idol against Yahweh God, God was making him a robe that he was going to be the head of the high priest. So no matter where you've been, what you've done, what you think has discredited you, none of it's true because God sees you as that white screen, perfect, spotless, Lamb of God, Lamb of God has redeemed you and he's got a plan for you that is beyond your understanding. And he's got it waiting for you. Right there. How's your relationship with the Holy Spirit? It all starts with him. If God can love us unconditionally, forgive us our sins, we can simply live in the life of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, self-control, fruit. Let us be known as a church that produces fruit. Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Father, there's some times where, where your word is revealed to us and we say, how? It's very simple. You ask us to receive it by faith. We ask for the filling of the Holy Spirit. We ask for the production of fruit. And as that fruit starts to produce, those ways of the flesh melt away and we walk in the light. Yes, we will make mistakes, but you constantly remind us, whose child are you? Sons and the daughter of the Most High God, chosen and redeemed. Father, there's people who are sitting here today listening and they relate to the fleshly list. We pray that through the power of the Holy Spirit, they're reminded that they're redeemed. It does not have control over them. They're not bondage to 
the sinful ways, but they have been enlightened and open to the spiritual ways. Give us that fullness of the Spirit to walk in your ways, as Paul says. Bless us as a body of believers. Bless the families. Keep us safe. Let us go forth with the power and might that we sat in the presence of God today and we leave here saying, Yes, Jesus, I'm empowered to produce. I thank you for what you've already done today. In Jesus' name, amen. Looking at a room full of producers. Receive the benediction of our Lord this morning. God will bless you. God will keep you. He makes his face shine on you. He's gracious to you. Turns his face towards you. Grant you his peace. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Go in peace and serve the Lord. And have a great week.